Within this video, we're going right into the airbrush techniques that I used to paint this one. I'll be going through a fair amount of information and I'm aware that some of this is going to be pretty dense and maybe even boring at times. Sounds like fun, right? I'm really selling the video. But the goal here is just to show as much information as I can using both opaques and transparent colors and where I like to use them within my paintings. So we'll be picking this one up from where we left off in last week's video and we're going to start on the upper left hand side here with this yellow rose. For any of the preliminary stuff, make sure you check out last week's video in that one. I just showed how I set everything up and we painted in the first few flowers. That one also included some art history, so none of that in this one. We're just going to get into this painting. The color in my airbrush right now is yellow. I'm using this right out of the bottle, so it's going to be extremely high saturation. In most of my paintings, I usually like to desaturate colors, and the way you do that is very simple. You just add a small amount of the complementary color into it. So even though I'm using this yellow right out of the bottle, and it's going to be highly saturated, you know, a very bright, deep yellow, if you want to desaturate it a little bit, all you need to do is add the complementary color, and the complementary color to yellow is violet. So if you want to make a slightly less saturated yellow, you could use a mixture like 20 parts yellow to one part violet. We'll be doing that later on for a few different colors, but for now I'm just using this yellow, and the goal here is to get an even value of this across this entire rose. I only want this yellow color on this rose, so in order to prevent any overspray, you'll see me just using a free hand shield here. So that's what I'll use for the bottom of it because the flower underneath that is going to be white as you can see in my completed painting on the left side of the screen. But for the rest of it I'll just paint it in freehand because a little bit of this yellow overspray is not going to affect much. And now this illustration color yellow is a transparent color so you can see underneath the hue, underneath the yellow color, you can still see my pencil lines. And this is going to be very helpful for the next part. It's going to act as a guide, kind of like a cheat sheet, so I can see where my darker values are going to go, where shadows are going to stop, and where they're going to end. To paint in these shadows, I'm also going to be using a transparent color, and this one is a mixture of burnt umber and cobalt blue. The color burnt umber is like a very dark and desaturated orange. So what I decided to do was desaturate it a little bit more, and the complementary color to orange is blue, so I used a very small amount of cobalt blue into the mixture. The mixture is something like 15 parts burnt umber to 1 part cobalt blue. And because this color is transparent, I'm going to control all my values by how much paint I spray. So you'll see me using a ripped piece of paper here, and I'm lining it up with the petals to start painting in some of those shadows. Each one of these shadows is going to have a gradient, and a gradient is a transition in values from darker at the base where it starts to a little bit lighter as the shadow starts to fade away into the midtone and then eventually into the highlight. And the midtone is going to be the yellow color that we already painted in, that transparent yellow. And what you'll see me doing here is switching off between different freehand shields and rip paper. Each one of these I'm using to line up with each one of the petals. And then I lightly spray in this burnt umber and blue mixture just to add a slightly cooler value and a darker value for the shadows. This burnt umber color is still a very warm color. It's still a desaturated orange, but compared to the yellow, it's going to look a little bit cooler. So now as I'm painting this, I'm just going to continue my way up this flower, working from the left side over to the right. And I'm looking at the reference photo. I'm looking at what's going to guide me, trying to see where those shadows start and where they end. If you notice in my completed painting, each one of these shadows is going to start right behind a petal. The petal is going to be sticking out, so it's going to be catching some light. It's going to have a highlight on it. And then right behind that is going to be a shadow or a cast shadow. Because this burnt umber mixture is a transparent color, I'm using the shield first to get in that sharp line, that transition point, or a ripped piece of paper to do that. And then I'll spray in the rest freehand. I'll just spray in some gradients, spraying more where I want some darker values, and spraying less where I want some brighter ones. And so at this point, I have a good amount of those shadows, mid-tones, and half-tones in, so it's time to start pulling out a few of the highlights and specular highlights. This yellow rose is not going to have any direct specular highlights, but it's going to have some pretty bright highlights. So I'll use my eraser to pull these out, and if they're not bright enough, you'll see what I'm doing here is switching over to an electric eraser. Electric erasers are just so aggressive and they're going to cut right through the paint, but what I still like to do with this is just to apply less pressure. I'm not really pressing it into the canvas. I kind of just float it over the surface of it. And then I just lightly touch it to the canvas and move it around just like I'm drawing. And just like I said in last week's video, I'm switching off between the two. If I want a more controlled highlight that's a little bit more subtle, 
I'll use the stick eraser, which is an ink eraser. And then if I want them really bright or a specular highlight, and remember that a specular highlight is a highlight that's directly reflecting the light source, you usually see it on something wet within a painting or a piece of metal. But for these brighter highlights, this is where I'm using the electric eraser. And then once I have those highlights in, I'm going right back to that transparent mixture of burnt umber with some cobalt blue, and I'll start glazing some of these colors over the top just to knock down some of those highlights and just to darken up a few areas. Now the real challenge of using transparent paints is that it's very easy to accidentally spray too much and go a bit too dark, which is what happened here on this rose. There's a way you can make that easier by mixing a semi-opaque color, which is basically a transparent color that's mixed with some opaque white. We'll talk about that later, but for this part I was using that transparent color and in the center here I just noticed it got too dark. I accidentally sprayed too much of it and I kind of want the light in this painting to be kind of shining from left to right. So this part of the painting that I'm just drawing this line over on the left side of the screen is going to be illuminated. And when things in nature are in very bright light, sometimes the colors and the contrast just get washed out. You can't really see that much detail and it just doesn't look as sharp as it could in more natural or softer lighting. So I knew here that I needed to make the center of this lighter. Now I have two options, two ways of going about doing this. One is the way that I usually like to do it, just by using an eraser and erasing in small circular motions to pull out an even texture and just kind of remove some of that paint to make it lighter. When you remove paint like this, you're just exposing some more of that white gesso underneath, making the hue, which is the color, lighter. And so that's what I decided to do first. I'm using my stick eraser and I'm erasing out in small circular motions, just trying to get an even value of paint lifted off here so the center just looks a little bit brighter. Not everyone is gonna agree with this, but I personally love a lot of texture in my paintings. I think it looks kind of interesting and it just adds a little bit something to the painting if you look at it up close. And so I just kept working at it with the eraser, but like I said before, I want this area to be in a very bright highlight, so the texture should be washed out. It shouldn't be as textured as what I'm getting here. So unfortunately, all this work that I did here to erase at the highlights just wasn't good enough. I mean, this rose could be just fine for the painting, but it wasn't what I was looking for. So what I decided to do here was switch over to an opaque color and start just kind of spraying it over the top just to soften everything up. The color I'm switching over to here is opaque white. I'm using this directly from the bottle just to maintain some of that opacity. And when a paint is thick like this, it's going to be a little bit harder to spray. So I bump my PSI up from around 20 to just around 30, just to help atomize that paint a little bit better. And the first thing I want to do here is start toward the top of the rose where I made some mistakes, where I rested my hand on the painting, some of the paint lifted up, and some areas just seem a bit too dark. The most popular pigment in whites today is titanium dioxide. It's a great pigment. It's a very opaque white. It's one of the most opaque white pigments that you can get today. It reflects something like 97% of the light, and it's also got very high tinting strength. But even though this is a very opaque color, we're spraying thin layers of it through an airbrush. An airbrush atomizes and sprays the paint, and what it's doing is it's just atomizing, spraying a bunch of small little particles, very little dots of white paint. So in practice, when you lay down your first few thin coats with an airbrush, it's still an opaque color, but you're going to be able to see through it because you're not getting 100% coverage. And so when you're working with an airbrush, spraying thin layers at a time, you're almost always kind of dealing with transparent colors, even if the pigment is opaque, just because you're spraying it thinly. In order to get the opacity to make it really opaque, you need to spray it at 100% or a bunch of thin layers that fully fill up, all those dots come together, and you get the opacity of the final paint film. And so that's what's going on here. I'm trying to clean up a few areas toward the top of the rows for now, just some of the mistakes and some of the areas that are too dark. And again, even though it's a highly opaque color, I sprayed it so thin so you could definitely still see through it in some areas. So after I put some of this down, you probably notice that the value lightened up, right? This is definitely a lighter color, but you'll also notice that the hue is very different. This doesn't really look like a yellow anymore. It looks almost like a grayish bluish color. And that's the blue shift in airbrush painting. There's a bunch of ways to get around this. You could add some orange into the mixture. You could spray orange over the top. But what I'm gonna do here is go right back to that transparent yellow. and I'm gonna glaze a very thin, even layer over the top of it. I want to make sure that I do this slow and just build up the layers 
And what I like to do is I like to step back from the painting and just look at it. If I notice that the hue is slightly off, I'll just come back in with that transparent color, spray it right over the top. And you can see what that does. We got the value raised up. Everything's brighter because we sprayed a good amount of that white paint in some areas, building up the opacity and lightening it. And then this glaze of the transparent yellow knocks down some of that value and also shifts the hue more toward yellow from that neutral color that we had before. So I'm going to go back to that white and speed up the video, work here on a larger area to show you what this is going to do. I am, of course, spraying this paint pretty lightly, building up layer by layer. And you can see it's definitely an opaque color, right? It's covering up a lot of that paint underneath. But again, since it's so thin, you can still see some areas through it. But the goal here was to do two things. One is to lighten it up. And the second is to remove that texture, that erasing texture, because I want this one to be softer. So this definitely did those two things. Everything's softer and lighter, but the color is off. We have that blue shift. So what I'm doing here is going right back to that yellow, that transparent yellow, and just evenly spraying it over the top. And you can see right here what that does. The color or the hue is now matching. I'm still going to work a little bit more on this one, but I got the effect that I wanted. Everything is softer. Now this is going to look like lights hitting it, and we're just not going to see that much texture or detail within it. So that's it for this rose for now. I'll just go back to some of that black paint, start adding in some of the background just to kind of make this stick out. What we're going to do now is move on to this white flower just below it. The first thing I want to do is paint in the background, get that black paint in so we have some separation between the flower and the background. So I used some frisket film, cut it out, and then went right over to the black paint, sprayed on a few layers to darken it up. For this flower, there's going to be an absolute ton of shadows and highlights and different areas of light and dark. So this one took me a very long time, and what I'm going to be doing here is switching off between all different types of shields and some frisket film. For this white color, I'm only going to be using one mixture, and that's the color black. We're going to get that white by erasing into the black, exposing some more of that gessoed canvas underneath, giving us those really bright high values. The one thing that I noticed about black by Createx Illustration Colors is that it's a very, very difficult pigment to erase. And because I want to use erasing techniques on this specific flower, what I decided to do here is to overly reduce the paint. I reduced it about 75% with distilled water to 25% of the black paint. Now a few things are going to happen here. The first is that this water is really going to break up that binder, so it's going to be a lot easier to erase. But because of that, this paint is not going to have good adhesion. It's actually going to have pretty poor adhesion. So this is an area that is absolutely going to need a clear coat when the painting's done. And so at the end of this painting, I will be adding a thin clear coat and then a final permanent varnish just so all these pigments are sealed in. And the next thing that's going to happen is because this paint is so thin, it can be very easy to accidentally spray too much where it starts to spider web out on the canvas. So the solution to that is to drop the PSI. I'm spraying here right around 15 PSI. A micron does very well at lower PSIs. And because this paint is so thin, I'm going to get a lot more control at that lower pressure. And what I'm doing here is working from one petal to the next, paying attention to where I see shadows. And then just like I said before, I'm using either a freehand shield or a ripped piece of paper to set in that transition point. I line it up where the shadow starts and begin to spray on some of this transparent paint. Again, all my values are going to be controlled by how much paint I spray. And so you'll see me using all different types of shields here, just constantly moving them around and spraying small parts at a time. If I spray in small sections of the shield, I can get basically any shield to fit the curve that I'm looking for so I can paint in the shapes of these petals. And I want to be careful not to spray too much of this paint right away. I want to keep it lighter because like I said, it's a difficult pigment to erase. But because I over reduced it as I switch over to the eraser, like I'm doing here, it just becomes so much easier than if you're using this paint right out of the bottle or just slightly reduced like 10 or 15%. As I work my way up here, there's an area I definitely need to mask off because I don't want any black paint getting on that yellow. So I use two pieces of 3M vinyl tape. And the nice thing about vinyl is you can kind of bend it around curves, stick it on the canvas. So that's what I did. I masked off the yellow and then I just used a ripped piece of paper just to get in that edge on the bottom right. For some of these petals on the right, there's just too many angles and curves to use tape or a freehand shield. 
So what I'm doing here is using some frisket, I placed it on and cut it out. And then to mask off the yellow rose, I used a thin piece of vinyl tape again, just placed it around that curve. And then from here, I could just focus in on painting this one petal, looking at where I see the darker values and the transitions between these gradients. Now I have to be very careful around the vinyl tape because you can see it's just a thin piece. So overspray can easily get past that. So when I spray in that area, you'll see me just using a piece of paper to mask off the yellow behind it. And you can see here, once I remove the frisket and the vinyl tape, we just get nice sharp edges around this petal, which is in the background. And then from here, I'm just going to be using those two techniques, frisket film and freehand shields to mask off areas. And this part is very similar to graphite drawing because I'm just using a monochromatic tone. It's just that transparent black. And all those highlights are being pulled out from the eraser. And so there's no secrets or tricks to doing this. It's really about drawing, paying attention to what you see. As I'm looking at the reference photo, I'm just paying attention to the edges. If some of them are sharp, some of them are soft. And then also those transitions between values. Within the center here, the hue switches to a pretty saturated green. So what I'm using here is the color moss green. I'm using this right from the bottle. And I'm just kind of dusting in some of this paint just to kind of get it green and darken it up a bit. And this color is also transparent. So you can see that I wanted it a bit darker in the center. So I sprayed some more paint there and then lighter as I worked my way out. I noticed some dots and some texture here. So I'm using that texture template that I love to use in my portraits and just kind of laying it over this and spraying some more of that green. So that takes care of the shadows. For a few of the highlights, there's some bright specular highlights. So I'm using an electric eraser. I'm just lightly tapping this to the canvas, pulling out some small white dots. And with an electric eraser, it generally pulls out the paint a bit too bright. So what I'll do is I'll just spray some of this green over the top again. That's a glaze. It's going to shift the color back to that green hue, and it's also going to darken everything up. As I work my way down, I'm just going to be using freehand shields here and some rip paper just to define the edges of each one of these petals. There's a lot down here, so I just have to take my time and work it one at a time. If you look over at my completed painting, you'll notice that we have that light that I was talking about before shining right across the top part of this flower. And in order to get that effect, to make something look bright in a painting, you need dark values surrounding it. We have plenty of dark values around here, but the lower part of this flower, which is going to be in shadow, is going to need to be darker. So as I'm spraying this, I'm trying to add some more paint to darken this up. But if it's not dark enough after I complete it, the great thing about the airbrush is that I could just use this transparent color and lightly spray it over the entire bottom. A thin glaze like that will knock down all the values, knock down some of the contrast, and just darken up the area. And that's one of the reasons why I love the airbrush, because you could do things like that, which just saves so much time. You know, you don't have to actually go in and repaint each one of the petals. You can kind of alter a large area in one shot. And of course, you could do this in traditional media like oil paint. Artists have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. But with oil paint, if you want to apply a glaze, you really have to let it dry. That could take a few days up to a few weeks. And that's just one of the really nice things about modern acrylics. You could use them with a paintbrush or an airbrush like I do here. And they just dry and cure so much faster. So layers and glazing just become so much easier. So let me show you a quick example of that. As I was painting the right side of this flower, I noticed that this area right here that I'm circling was still a bit too light. The value was not dark enough. And so all I needed to do was just take the airbrush freehand with some of that transparent black in it and then just lightly spray it over this area. I don't want to go too dark. I just want to keep it light. And you can see just a small amount like that just darkens everything up and knocks back some of the contrast. This is also going to make the areas above it look lighter because, again, to make something look light, you need dark values surrounding it. And when you apply a glaze freehand like this, you are going to get overspray in some areas you don't want. So I'm just going to constantly go back around everything with the eraser just to clean everything back up. And then that's going to be it for this flower. This one is basically done. As I paint some more, as I paint in some of the flowers surrounding it, I'll probably come back to this later on and adjust it if needed. But for now, this is good enough and we'll move on to the next flower. This flower right in the center is called a Gerber daisy and it's kind of a reddish pink color. So the first thing I'm doing here is just lightening up my initial transfer lines just so they're not too dark and they don't show through. And the tool that I'm using for this is a kneaded eraser. The color that I'm going to be using here is a mixture of scarlet, which is a transparent color, and opaque white, which is obviously an opaque color. I'm using equal parts, about 20 drops of each, and then I reduced it about 10% with some distilled water. 
So what's going to happen here is that white color is going to lighten that transparent red. So it's going to give us a pink hue. And then also it's going to add some opacity into the mixture. The color scarlet is a transparent color. So that means the more that I spray of it, the darker it's going to get. Transparent colors can only darken as you spray them. So the white that I added into the mixture is going to add some opacity to it. And it's also going to lighten that value. So if I spray this at 100%, you know, just do layer after layer, it's going to stop at a certain value depending on how much white I added to it. So you can see at the bottom of this petal, I sprayed it pretty much at 100% here. And it's going to lock at that value because the white is going to prevent it from getting darker. So this color is considered a semi-opaque color. It's still opaque because of that white, but since it's mixed with 50% of the scarlet, which is a transparent color, it's just going to lose a little bit of that opacity. This technique of mixing white into a transparent color has been used for hundreds of years throughout art history. And of course, in nature, there are different pigments, some of which are transparent, semi-transparent, opaque, and semi-opaque. But one of the most common ways that artists have been adding opacity to color is just by mixing some white into the mixture. And again, that's also going to lighten the value of that color, but it's going to be helpful here because I don't want areas of this flower to get too dark right away. Now that semi-opaque color is going to be a lot more forgiving because even if I accidentally spray too much, it'll never get too dark. It's always going to lock at that value. And then once I erase out some highlights, I'm going to switch back over to the color scarlet like I'm doing here. This is right from the bottle, so it's going to be a transparent color. And I'm just going to glaze it over the top to help darken up some of the areas that were just a little bit too light. And one of the great things about paintings is that you have so many options. You could either use a transparent, you could use an opaque, or you can mix them like I'm doing in a lot of this painting. But as I'm using a semi-opaque here, I have to be careful around some of the darker areas behind it because this lighter value will get into those areas and lighten them up where a transparent wouldn't really do much. It'll just kind of shift the hue because a transparent color can only darken an area. But just like everything else in airbrush painting, you have to be very aware of your overspray. So with a semi-opaque like this, I have to worry about it lightening up dark areas and also darkening some of the light areas like the white flower over to the left. But that sprayed atomized paint is also what makes an airbrush so special because it's always giving you those soft, smooth transitions and gradients. Overspray has a way of finding itself into parts of the painting that you didn't expect. So as long as you're aware of it, you can deal with it. It's not a problem. It's just part of the painting process. And so now as I work my way around this flower, I'll be using that semi-opaque color for the majority of it and then erasing into the paint. But you'll notice in some areas of this that I will just use some white right out of the bottle, just like I showed before on the yellow rose. Spray that in an area to lighten it up and then come back to the transparent scarlet, glaze it over the top to get the hue back to where it was. So that's where I'm going to wrap this video up. I'm just going to continue painting this flower here. Same techniques all the way around of adding some paint, erasing into it, and then glazing some transparents over the top. When working on your own airbrush paintings, make sure you experiment. Try those transparents. Try those opaques. Mix some semi-opaques. The more you play around with different colors, different mixtures, the more you're going to learn. You'll learn what you like and what you don't. But above all else, have fun with it and enjoy that process of painting. And one last thing before I go, I know that I always say this, just remember to slow down. There's no need to rush. Painting is not a race. With things like YouTube, social media, everything just looks so fast. I sped up a lot of this video. You know, it looks here like I finished this one in a half hour, but that's not the case at all. This one took me over three weeks. I'm a pretty slow painter anyway. It took me around 80 hours. But the reason I'm telling you that is just to remind you to slow down. There are times when it can be beneficial to paint fast, like plain air painting, when you're painting outside, trying to get something from life. And of course, there are many artists who do paint fast, and there's nothing wrong with that. That could be a good thing if that's what you enjoy. Me personally, I'm not one of them. I like to work slow. So if you're like me, just try to enjoy it. For the rest of this tutorial, we'll be finishing it up on the members page within a few weeks. And of course, I want to say thank you so much to these amazing people the generous support of the channel members. First off, I'd like to thank you, Marco, for your very generous super thanks in last week's video. Again, that's so nice of you. Thank you so much. I'd also like to welcome the newest members, Tokuji, Mamet, Donny at a generous tier three and backslash. Thank you guys all so much and welcome to the channel. And so that's it for this week's video. I hope all of you have a great weekend and a great week ahead. I'll see you back here next Friday.